course, conservatives have long uh, mocked the idea of discrimination, the idea that people lose, right, on the marketplace or whatever we want to call it, that that's just something that snowflakes need to suck up and deal with. But once it becomes a problem for them, they're quick to say, I'm being discriminated against. From Miami Law, I'm Annette Uges, and this is The Explainer. Welcome to another episode of the Miami Law Explainer, where legal experts take a plunge into the context and relevance behind the headlines. This summer, Apple removed the contentious InfoWars podcast from iTunes. In the days that followed, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and others banned InfoWars founder Alex Jones's content from their platforms. Joining the explainer today is Dr. Marianne Franks, President and Policy Director of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative and advisor to Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Microsoft on issues of privacy, extortion, harassment, and online threats. Let's go to explainer producer Catherine Skibb for the interview. Good morning, Marianne. Welcome to the explainer. Good morning. I think before we start talking about hate speech, we should probably address the bombs that were sent to Trump's political rivals this week. Right. So it's been in the news a lot recently that about 10 or so explosive devices have been delivered to these addresses of people that have been perceived as people critical of uh, President Trump. So how do you think that fits into the bigger picture of hate speech? Well, since it's early yet, we don't really know necessarily what the motivations are behind these kinds of actions, but there has been some speculation, and it seems to be reasonable, that maybe one of the potential causes for this type of violence would be that there has been, of course, incredibly inflammatory speech directed at these individuals, including the Clintons, uh, the Obamas, Maxine Waters, and others. And a lot of that speech has come from President Trump himself and from his supporters. So that brings us to uh, InfoWars and Alex Jones. Can we talk a little about what happened in August with the social platforms and InfoWars? Well, beginning in August, several different major platforms, including Apple, YouTube, Spotify, Facebook, and others took action against Alex Jones, uh, basically saying, look, he's violating our terms and policies when it comes to hate speech and harassment. And so we're going to remove some of his content from our sites. And that was followed by uh, Twitter eventually did also decide that uh, Alex Jones and some of the accounts associated with Alex Jones had also violated its terms and services, and they have permanently suspended Alex Jones from their platform. What was the reaction from Jones and his followers? Perhaps predictably, Alex Jones said that this is uh, an attempt to censor him, that this is political suppression. And many of his supporters, of course, echoed that, saying that this is clearly a coordinated conspiracy against Alex Jones and people like him. And that theme not only was expressed by Alex Jones and his followers, but was also picked up by many other conservative figures, politicians and others, that uh, there's a bias against conservatives on social media platforms. How credible is that? Well, part of this depends on what we mean by censorship. If what we mean is that there are certain types of people who are being banned or their content is being prohibited from certain types of sites, I suppose one could in some sense call that censorship. If what people mean is that this is a violation of their First Amendment rights, then that's incorrect because these private platforms, because they are private companies, do not have First Amendment obligations. They're not required to carry anybody's speech. And just like the owner of a restaurant or a store would be able to remove somebody from their premises if they were engaging in behavior that that particular store owner did not approve of, the same can be done for private platforms because they're not the government. So in that sense, the term censorship is clearly meant to invoke something like massive government suppression, but that's inaccurate because this is nothing more than the actions of private parties. Can you talk a little more widely about uh, freedom of speech and how it's been used historically? Well, there's a long and fairly complicated history about freedom of speech in this country. And one of the most interesting things about that conversation is that we tend to pretend that it's not a very complicated history. The orthodoxy on freedom of speech is usually something like everybody gets to say what they want and nobody can be regulated, nobody can be censored. But what it's actually meant in practice is that certain powerful members of society have always had the opportunity to speak, even when their speech tended to silence and to oppress and harass and dehumanize others. And what is interesting about the current 
controversies over freedom of speech is that those very same powerful people are now claiming to be censored and oppressed in contexts in which, of course, they still have considerable domination and, as I mentioned before, are not actually having their First Amendment rights violated. Um, so you're saying that the people were not heard because of these powerful people. Who was not being heard? When we think about the effects of let's say, harmful speech or what is sometimes called hate speech, although that term doesn't really have a legal definition, and so it's a tricky term to use. But let's think about the impact of speech that threatens or intimidates or dehumanizes individuals, especially if that speech is targeted at more vulnerable members of society, for instance, women or people of color. If people of color and women are hearing these messages, being told that, look, if you speak up, if you say anything, if you act in a way we don't like, you're going to be hurt or injured or attacked, then the quite um, obvious result is going to be that those groups of people will be less likely to speak. They will be much more likely to self-censor. And so in that paradoxical way, the exercise of freedom of speech on behalf of these kind of uh, oppressive impulses or these kinds of figures actually results in a negative um, impact on speech. That is to say, certain groups are silenced because of that. Why was Alex Jones shut down on social media? There was this popular misconception that Alex Jones was shut down because of what he's probably most famous for, which is his conspiracy theories, his allegations that, for instance, the Parkland students are crisis actors. But as it turns out, that's not the reason why he was banned from those particular platforms. The specific terms and policies that he has apparently violated have more to do with harassment and bullying and hate speech regulations that these particular platforms happen to have. So are the companies biased against conservatives? There again is a very popular conception that these social media platforms, um, even if they're not, of course, First Amendment actors, there's still this complaint that they're actually engaging in the suppression of conservative speech. And there doesn't seem to be any empirical evidence for that uh, assertion. Nonetheless, it's been troubling to watch these companies have to sort of scramble for explanations. And we've seen this as kind of a tactic that conservatives have used a lot in the last few years, which is to create an accusation that is not actually grounded in reality and yet be able to shift the entire conversation in that direction. So constantly the social media platforms are having to play kind of defense and try to go out of their way to sort of overclaim this idea or, or defend themselves against this claim that they're suppressing conservatives, even though there really is no indication of that. And if anything, what you're saying more often is suppression of liberal or more progressive speech. Um, what's Alex Jones and, and his followers doing now to get their, quote, message out? So Alex Jones still has a considerable following, and it's important to keep in mind it's something that gets lost in these conversations about social media companies because they are so powerful and so prominent, is that Facebook and Twitter and even Apple, they don't actually make up the entire universe. And so Alex Jones still has his shows, he's still got his ways of communicating with his followers, and he's still got plenty of fans who believe in his message. And in addition to all of that, on Twitter and various other social media platforms, he's got plenty of other associated accounts that are managing to contravene this kind of ban and to still get his message out to his people on those platforms. So is, are the social media companies continuing to shut down accounts as they pop up that contain Jones's message? Some of the companies have been engaging in very careful analysis and I guess you could say have been monitoring to see if those bans are being contravened because it's important for these social media platforms own rights of speech and ability to have the kinds of services, to offer the kinds of services they want to be able to monitor and enforce their own policies. But it's difficult because the nature of social media makes it quite complicated to shut down every account that might be associated with a particular a uh, person or, or entity that might have engaged in some violation of policies. So it's really quite a difficult task. And the other piece of this, of course, is that these companies are not necessarily deeply invested in making sure that this kind of speech is not on their platforms. What's been lost in some of the controversy this year has been the historic sort of indifference that these social media companies have had towards hateful speech and incendiary speech. This didn't really become an issue, and people like Alex Jones didn't really have a problem with Twitter or Facebook until it seemed to be that maybe Twitter and Facebook didn't like Alex Jones as much as he liked them. What has actually been true for as long as the internet has been with us has been that most powerful companies and entities have actually allowed hate speech and threatening speech and defamatory speech to flourish. And this 
recent uh, sort of turnaround, this minor turnaround. And August is actually quite novel and new and is certainly not doing enough to, to address the imbalance that we already have in terms of powerful speakers versus not so powerful speakers. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, what will be interesting to see is that right now, Alex Jones, for instance, is engaged in several lawsuits against the companies that he thinks are pressing him. For instance, most recently, PayPal actually dropped Alex Jones um, from their service. And Alex Jones is particularly worried about that because it hits them in the pocketbook. And so he's filed a lawsuit against PayPal. So we'll see how some of those cases work out. It will be possibly an educational moment for the public to see the reminder that we apparently all need that the First Amendment does not protect the right for you to say whatever you want, wherever you want. It really is a pretty limited right that says the government is not allowed to throw you in jail or do something else to you for your speech, but that private companies can do what they want. So that's probably useful in the sense that it's going to remind the general public that that's what the First Amendment is. It doesn't give you something more. And it's useful also because Alex Jones is essentially making a claim for himself, as many conservatives are, that he's a victim, that he somehow is being oppressed and he is being silenced and he is being persecuted. And when they make these claims, they tend to invoke this discrimination model, which is ironic because, of course, conservatives have long mocked the idea of discrimination, the idea that people lose, right, on the marketplace or whatever we want to call it, that that's just something that snowflakes need to suck up and deal with. But once it becomes a problem for them, they're quick to say, I'm being discriminated against. And where they are, of course, wrong is that discrimination law does not usually afford protections for people's opinions or their views. We protect people from discrimination on the basis of characteristics that they either cannot change or should not have to change. Political affiliation and the desire to engage in hateful speech is not one of those protected categories. So again, however painful those particular suits might be for those particular companies, this is probably going to be good for the public to be educated about. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm sure we'll be getting together on another topic soon. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Explainer. Next week on our show, we'll be sitting down with Innocence Clinic director Craig Trochino to look at movement in the case of Stephen Avery, the focus of the Netflix hit Making a Murderer. I'm your host, Annette Ugas. This week's show was brought to you by Miami Law's third annual Class Action Forum, a gathering of leading judges, practitioners, and scholars in the field of tort and class action litigation. Join us at the Newman Alumni Center on December 7th. For more information, go to law.miami.edu backslash MCAF.